science is asking questions with an open mind and forget what you've learned, forget the concept you've learned, because otherwise you will miss new facts and new ideas. Do you think there's an element of protectionism? It's, right? fr it's fear. Yeah. It's fear. I think when, when you have always told and, and written articles and doing research uh, where to find consciousness somewhere in the brain and you seem to be wrong, then you lose your, your, your research money, you re lose your position in university. I know some professors have lo lost their position in universities because they had the different ideas. So um, they're frightened. And I know some professors who do privately tell me, you could be right. But officially, they say this is total nonsense until they retire. And then they said, I could have been wrong my whole life. In the first coronary care unit in, um, in the Netherlands. So we resuscitated a man of 44 years old who had a cardiac arrest due to acute myocardial infarction. And we had, I think, three or four times defibrillation. And he regained consciousness after about four minutes. And we were so happy as a resuscitation team, I was the doctor in charge. I mean, it was all new for us. And the patient regained consciousness. He was alive again. But the patient was very, very disappointed. And told us about going through a tunnel, talking about the light and beautiful landscape, beautiful music. I always tell some uh, people, I've never forgotten this event, but I didn't do anything with it. I just started my specialization as a young family with two small children. So I never forgot it, but I didn't do anything with it. Until in 1986, I read a book by George Ritchie, Return from Tomorrow. And George Ritchie uh, had a near-death experience in 1943 as a medical student. He had a double pneumonia and he died because there were no antibiotics available for this medical student. And his body was covered with a sheet and the nurse was so upset that this medical student had died that she was able to persuade the doctor to give him an injection with adrenaline right into his heart, which was totally uncommon. But he, he regained consciousness. He was, after a period of nine minutes, he regained consciousness and was back again in his body. I just started to interview patients, ask patients who had survived the cardiac arrest in the past, if they could have memory from the period of her consciousness. And within two years, from 86 to 88, asking 50 patients who survived cardiac arrest, and 12 of them shared the NDE with me. And then started my scientific curiosity, because I've always learned from university medical school that it is impossible to have memories from the period of unconscious. When the heart stops during cardiac arrest, there's no circulation, no breathing, you're in coma, uh, you're, you're, you're dying, then it should be impossible, because the until now never proven hypothesis that consciousness brought in brain function, then it should be impossible because when the brain stop, uh, function stops, there should be no consciousness, let alone an enhanced consciousness with the possibility of perception out and above the body with emotions, with cognition, with memories from early childhood, etc. So that's how it started, scientific curiosity. And most people thought it was just an oxy of the brain, neurotransmitters in the brain, hallucinations, dreams, whatever, false memories. So we could explain all the other explanations as well. So we could exclude psychological explanations like the fear of death. We could exclude use of medication, whatever they got, it didn't matter at all. They, we could exclude gender, religion. If they were, if people were atheists of, of Christian or Muslim, it didn't matter at all. Education didn't matter at all. Foreknowledge, as you know that these are experience are possible didn't matter at all. So the main conclusion of our study was there was no medical scientific explanation why people have a near-death experience in cardiac arrest. That's the first thing. The second aspect is that we know that people with a cardiac arrest have no brain function at all left. So there have been studies on induced cardiac arrest in, 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 in humans, let's say for threshold testing in ICDs, so you induce a cardiac arrest, you test the ICD to find a good threshold. We also have done these studies in animals. What we see in those studies that when you have cardiac arrest, you lose consciousness within seconds. The blood flow to the brain, that you can measure here in a 
carotid artery is zero mm. within one second. The, the body reflexes are gone with the function of the cortex of the brain. The brain stem reflexes are gone, so the, the, the yank reflex, you put a finger in someone's throat without any problem. The cordial reflex, the, there are fixed dilated pupils who do not, do not react on, on light. There's no breathing anymore. The brain center is close to the brain stem. And when there have studies, and there have been studies on with the registration of the electric activity of the cortex of the brain, the EEG, the EEG always flatlines within 10 to 20 seconds. So we have proven that there is no brain function left after 20 seconds after cardiac arrest. And there is no patient ever been successfully resuscitated within 20 seconds. It always takes several minutes, even in the coronary care unit, to get people back. So we know now for sure that people who tell us about the inner death experience, it must have happened to the period that the brain didn't function at all. And that's the main conclusion. You have to initiate CPR as yeah. soon as possible because the first five to 10 minutes, the, the uh, loss of function of, of the brain is still reversible. That's why we call it clinical death. Mm. Clinical death is a period of unconsciousness caused by lack of circulation and breathing, and it's still reversible. But when you're too late, then there is irreversible damage to the brain and people will always die. So clinical death is the, the first stage of the process of dying. And we know from people who have a cardiac arrest outside the hospital, so out of hospital arrest, where you're not always as soon available, so you have a, a, a CPR, the mortality rate is more than 90% because you're too late. It was in the Lancet in 2001. And I was had two parts. That was the prospective study and the, and the longitudinal study. We'll come back later to the longitudinal study. But the out-of-body experience of this man was very impressive. He was found in coma in a meadow about 30 minutes before he was brought into a hospital. And people just found him and did some primitive CPR. When it's brought into the current carry unit, your body was already cold, was blue, there was no circulation, no breathing, no body reflexes, no brain cell reflexes. There were, his pupils didn't react to light. So the nurse was were quite upset with this long, young man who seemed to be die, dead. And the first thing he did was to start intubation to give him more oxygen. And when he tried to intubate the patient, he found out that this patient had a dentist in his mouth. So he took out his dentist and put them somewhere on the crash car. And it took one and a half hour before they had adequate circulation and heart rhythm back. But he was still in coma, still needed artificial respiration. And so he was transferred to the intensive care unit to continue the artificial respiration, uh, respiration for one week until he regained consciousness. And then he was or back to the cardiac ward. And it was just there when a nurse came in for medication. He saw the nurse, he said, you know where my dentists are. And the nurse was flabbergasted. And he said, yeah, you were there when I was brought into a hospital. And you took my dentist out of my, you took it, put it somewhere on the, there was a car with all those bottles on it. There was a sliding somewhere underneath. And there you put my dentist. So, and other commentators and, and people who are studying NDEs say that the brain is a filter as opposed to a generator of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. A transceiver or a filter, or what well, you can call it also an interface. Mm. And, and, and to, to understand this function of the brain is almost like to compare it with the internet. Um, there now at this moment, one billion websites and YouTube films go through your room, through your body. Some are always everywhere in the world, but you need a functioning computer to receive a part of this cloud. You need several codes to get several websites of YouTube films. And, but the websites are always there. And you need a functioning computer. And so you need a functioning brain to receive parts of this enhanced, or what I call non-local consciousness, to receive into your body and brain as a waking consciousness and it's just a part of this memories as well because when you're out of your body that's what we hear from patients with a death experience 
uh, you have all memories from early childhood. You're connected with other people as well. You have some type of future events as well. So you are in a realm where there is no time, no space. Everything is connected. And that's why we call it non-local consciousness. Everything is always connected without time, without space. So when they have a life review during a cardiac rest for five minutes, they can, they can talk for weeks because everything happens at the same moment. When you think of somebody, you will meet him. But when you think of a place, you will be there, always at the same moment. So it's a total different kind of consciousness as we have now, as we're sitting here in our waking consciousness. What, in, in, in terms of the future of the field of, of research for near-death experiences, what is left to uncover? I mean, there's a significant amount, of course, but where do you think people researchers should be directing their efforts? I think we have change science, to change science. We have to include subjective experience in science, what we call the post-materialist science. We have to accept subjective experiences as a scientific tool. We have to believe what people tell us. We have to, because what you are, the essence, essence of who you are is what you think and what you will learn. There will never, will never be an end to consciousness.